Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Andreas Caduto. I, I'm a penetration tester working for a large uh, financial services firm here in London. Um, being a penetration tester, I like uh, to break things, especially mobile and uh, web applications, but I also care about finding solutions to optimize uh, the cost of addressing security issues at scale. And I've also developed training uh, for developers and uh, pen testers about uh, secure coding and remediation. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about application security training. So as penetration testers, uh, we're still uh, finding lots of issues that have been around for more than 10 years. Uh, things like uh, cross-site scripting, SQLi, XXE, RC, and so on. And also lots of examples of wrong remediation uh, fixes that don't really remediate the issue. Uh, maybe they make, they, make, they make it hard uh, to exploit it, but the issue is uh, definitely still there. As a developer, uh, the focus is on creating a functional code. So, I mean, developers are not born knowing how to code securely. And um, education does, all, does not always include uh, security and even teaches the wrong advice sometimes. Uh, when security training is offered, uh, it's usually in the form of a computer-based training, which does not provide any practical examples for candidates to play with. For the business, it's also difficult to um, really measure uh, the competency in secure coding and remediation among uh, the developers, and it's also very difficult to calculate uh, return on investment uh, on security training, because often the assessment goes in the form of a multiple choice question quiz, which does not really assess uh, secure uh, coding and remediation uh, skills. So that's why I created uh, Remediate the Plug. It's an open source uh, application security platform. Um, the platform allows to run um, exercises. The purpose of the exercise is for candidates to find, exploit, and remediate an issue, 100% hands on, and no security and no multiple choice questions involved. Um, candidates are given um, an environment, a full development environment, uh, which uh, is ready within seconds and can be accessed uh, through a web browser. So there is nothing to distribute, no VMs or uh, things like that. Uh, in this exercise, in this environment, uh, uh, there is already a vulnerable app, uh, depending on the exercise that the user selected. And uh, in, the, in, this, in this environment, uh, we have an ID already configured with the code of the vulnerable exercise. The candidate can view this code, can modify it. Every time he makes a change to the code, uh, the changes are actually applied to a, to a vulnerable app running in the same environment. So candidates in this environment can really have a, uh, can really have a go in exploiting an issue uh, safely and um, then remediating the code and um, understanding whether the issue has been remediated or not. Um, during the exercise, uh, uh, the platform also allows the candidate to check um, automatically whether an issue has been remediated or not. So for candidates, it's just enough uh, to click on the refresh button and then behind the scenes, uh, the platform uh, will run some tests and uh, provide the candidate the information whether uh, the security issue has been remediated or not. If uh, the candidate is stuck, he can also request a hint. Of course, it uh, will uh, have an impact on the final score. At the end of the exercise, the platform also provides, uh, together with the results of the automated checker functionality that we saw earlier, uh, it also provides a diff between the original code of the exercise and the code that was uh, changed by the candidate. Uh, with this information, an assessor can quickly review, uh, based on the results from the automated checker and the code diff, whether the remediation approach is actually acceptable, because maybe, I don't know, you pass the test, but I don't know, the remediation you used is not in line with the best practices or if you need to follow an internal guideline. So if that is the case, then the assessor can provide additional training, additional feedback uh, uh, to the candidate. The platform also allows to set up uh, time box tournaments uh, called challenges, and these are a set of uh, exercises available to a set of users uh, within an organization. When setting up a challenge, it's also possible to choose programming language, target specific group of developers, or a specific vulnerabilities, for instance, where an issue has been previously identified. Exercises can target um, anything. Uh, they, can, um, they can focus on remediation, exploitation, secure coding, in a way to address the most prevalent security issues. The platform allows to run exercises which run in Docker containers, so it's possible to create uh, new exercises, uh, add new technologies. You can create an exercise on whatever you manage to run on Docker. So it's, uh, it can be extended. Uh, together with the platform, you also get a management interface uh, from where you can uh, manage all the aspects of the platform, configuration, and the IAM model is based around the concept of an organization. The organization can model either a company or a division within a company. 
then users uh, are part of an organization and they can be enrolled in a team. Exercises as well can be enabled or disabled on a per organization basis and challenges are a set of um, um, exercises uh, for users in an organization. Uh, besides the, the user role, there are also four uh, manager roles. Uh, depending on the role you get, uh, you have access to certain data or to some uh, write or uh, read the capabilities uh, within uh, um, uh, managing the platform. The platform also provides stats. So these uh, stats and metrics can really be used by the business to measure real competency in secure coding. And uh, with this, uh, thanks to the rich IM model, it's possible to view these stats uh, from different perspectives. So you can view them uh, from the perspective of a single user, from uh, the view of a team, uh, from the full organization, or even uh, by geographical, uh, geographical region. From uh, the stats and metrics, uh, uh, we can really quickly identify where are the gaps and then provide the targeted training uh, to fill those gaps. It's also possible to view uh, stats, uh, including uh, the remediation rate, uh, total time spent, average time spent, and lots of other metrics. I'll now move into a live demo. I hope it works. Huh? So I'll, um, I'll now log in as a regular user. So now we are inside the platform. Uh, these are uh, some, how do I, uh, I think I need to remove the full screen. No? Okay, okay, sorry. So I log in the platform, it's very small. I log in the platform, these are uh, some available exercises. I select, for instance, process scripting. Uh, we get a description about the exercise, some uh, suggested readings, and the exercise will last 40 minutes at most. After that, uh, we'll auto shut down. And uh, here we get some information about uh, when we start the exercise. So we will get a full um, desktop access through the browser. In this desktop, uh, we will wait patiently for Eclipse to start. And uh, then we will start the application server. In Eclipse, so there, there is already configured uh, all the projects, uh, the projects for this XSS exercise uh, that we just selected. Uh, when the application server starts, we'll switch to Firefox, we use these crets to get into the vulnerable app. When we are um, satisfied with the exercise, we can mark it as completed or it will auto shut down at the end of the time. And if we make some mistake, we can also restore the source to the original one and we can have a go again. Candidates also have the possibility to download an exercise reference document. This provides all the information about the exercise with step-by-step -step instructions and some API reference. So I'll now start the environment. Okay, it's ready. Now behind the scenes, uh, the platform created a container for this, uh, cross, for this cross scripting exercise and we are accessing this container through the web browser. So now we are, connecting, um, we are connected to this, uh, to this desktop. In this uh, environment, it's already configured uh, for our exercise. Uh, since it's a Java app, uh, we already have Eclipse configured uh, with, uh, with the vulnerable exercise and um, uh, the browser is set uh, to, um, to, 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 to take the user to the home page. So we wait patiently for Eclipse uh, to start. It has now started. We can uh, start the application server as referenced in the instruction. We see that the application server uh, is starting. It started. So if now we move uh, to, the, to um, Firefox, we can browse the vulnerable app and we can log in with the crats that were written in the instruction. So we are now in. We browse through the, through the instructions and here are the flags. So the flags are the actual exercise that you need either to remediate or to exploit. So in this exercise, we have three different flags, and for each flag, we see that there is an exploitation question and a remediation uh, question. Since the focus of this exercise is on uh, remediation, then the exploitation flag is marked as optional, but you can create exercises with any focus. Um, so if you read the instruction, they say to exploit the XSS in the app feedback functionality of the website feedback page. If we get a hint, we, we get we the suggestion to add a message with a particular payload. So if we browse the vulnerable app and to this, uh, to this section, we can, we can write a nice innocuous alert one. Sorry. We see a nice pop-up uh, is alerted. We refresh because it's stored, so we make sure it's actually stored, yes. So if we browse now to the instruction, so I mean we, we now understood that it's vulnerable. If we check, 
the platform confirms it's actually vulnerable. So now we read the, the remediation instruction. They say to remediate the issue by doing output encoding in this method, in this class. So we move back to Eclipse. And we browse to the affected class. So now we look for the vulnerable method. We see that it takes a user feedback list. This, uh, from this list, uh, the only user controllable input is the message. So we apply output encoding to this string. We use, we use the, the SAP library. And now we hit on save. When we hit on save, automatically, the application server will restart, and applying these changes to the running a vulnerable application. So now it refreshed. If we refresh the page, we will see that we no longer get the alert pop up. But now the string is encoded because it's uh, probably encoded for HTML, uh, which is the valid context uh, in this case. So if we browse to the platform and we check for the status of this exercise, it's now marked as not vulnerable. So we successfully remediated it. We can keep on and uh, complete the other exercises, or that when we are ready, we can mark the exercise as complete. When we mark it as complete, uh, it's pending review. So if now we log in uh, with uh, an admin, this is the admin interface. You can manage organization. Uh, on each organization, you can create invitation codes for user to join. Uh, you can set up and manage regional gateways. We will talk about this uh, later in the presentation. Users. Uh, teams, uh, you can dive in a team, you see what are the members, uh, stats about uh, uh, the particular team, and uh, we can also dive in the user, uh, send him a message, view some stats uh, and some achievements uh, for uh, the exercise he has taken so far. Uh, we can manage exercises, um, manage uh, the regions, the organization where they are available, export them and then re-import them in another platform, manage and running exercises, challenges, and finally, the pending reviews. So if we review this exercise, we can see here the flags that were in scope for the exercise, the hints that were used by the candidates, and finally we can get the results from the automated checker. So one is marked, uh, sorry, one is marked as not vulnerable and two as uh, vulnerable. So if we reference the diff, we can see that uh, only one vulnerability was actually addressed, and uh, the remediation is acceptable. So we can mark these as not vulnerable and these two as not addressed. Then we provide a score, a comment. Uh, we can also say whether the user, the user uh, deserved a trophy or whether he introduced new issue while remediating existing issues. And this happened a lot of times. And um, you can also um, reference some logs uh, about all the actions that were taken by the user uh, to complete the exercise. You can submit the review or mark it as canceled. If you submit it, it's marked in the stats uh, and also the user get, uh, gets access to the review, uh, to the results. Uh, and the possibility to download the solution exercise. Um, the stats, uh, you get a dashboard, then you get a global uh, remediation rate by the individual issue. Then you can uh, actually see a breakdown on whether the user remediated, broke the functionality, did not address, uh, um, successfully remediated, and so on. We can see the same data by category of issue. This time we can also see how much time was spent in total in average on each category, and then dive down with the usual uh, breakdown. Uh, starts by region, so geographical region, and uh, team. Also, my user is a manager of uh, two organizations, so if I remove one from the filter, now I get uh, a different uh, set of team, so all the stats are updated uh, depending on uh, the organization I'm, I'm using. So this uh, concludes the live demo. I hope you liked it. No, it's not finished. <laughs> And uh, we're now, because I mean, I'm very tight with, uh, with times, and uh, we're now in the second part of uh, the presentation. I'm gonna discuss the architecture, installation, configuration, and how to extend the platform. So RTF is based on a microservices architecture, can be deployed on AWS uh, through CloudFormation. All this infrastructure will be created automatically by running the template. So in the, te the template creates uh, VPC with two service uh, subnets. Uh, for uh, the RTF services and two exercise subnets for the RTF exercises. These subnets are in two availability zones to provide uh, high availability to the, to the platform. In the RTF uh, services uh, subnet, the template deploys, uh, it's uh, on the top, the, te the template deploys um, um, an ECS cluster. Uh, this ECS cluster is where we run uh, the Docker containers for the RTF services. So the RTF services are the RTF database 
the RTF uh, gateway and the RTF portal. The database holds the data of the platform and uh, it also since it runs on a Docker container to ensure the survival of data, uh, the data directory is actually mounted from an elastic file system, so no matter where, which EC2 instance of the cluster uh, uh, the container is run, it will always uh, have access to the same set of data. The gateway mediates the access between the users to the exercise <coughs> containers. So when we saw earlier that you open a new tab and you see the, uh, the desktop, that's the RTF gateway that, uh, that creates an RDP connection to the container, turns that into an HTML5 stream, which is then rendered by the user's browser. Uh, the RTF portal is the web application uh, from um, that you know, can the, the users and managers can use uh, to interact uh, with, uh, with the platform. The traffic is routed uh, to the RTF gateway and portal through an application load balancer, which um, routes the traffic to all the containers that are deployed for uh, these two services. The number of containers can uh, vary. Uh, it automatically scales based on the memory utilization of the containers. And also the EC2 instances on which uh, the ECS cluster is, uh, is deployed will auto scale based on the memory reservation of the cluster. So this ensures uh, complete uh, transparent uh, scalability based on demand. Um, in the other two subnets, uh, the RTF exercises subnet, uh, we um, deploy a different cluster, this time for the RTF um, exercises. So every time a user wants to run an exercise, this is actually running a Docker container deployed in the ECS cluster for exercises. Um, traffic to these containers is only allowed through the RTF gateway, which mediates all the access. And uh, these containers have no outbound uh, connectivities. They don't have any capability to share data with the host or uh, with, uh, with outside the container. So they're very DLP friendly for corporate environments. And um, the instances on which the ECS cluster uh, uh, is deployed also perform auto scaling uh, based on the memory reservation of the cluster. So of course, uh, the more EC2 instances you have deployed in a cluster, the more RTF exercises you can run concurrently. All the logs are pushed uh, to AWS CloudWatch, uh, so you can reference them in a single place. So just to summarize, uh, when a user wants to run an exercise, it will issue a request to the RTF portal. The RTF portal launches a container in the ECS cluster for exercises. It then, uh, the portal issues a request to the RTF gateway. The RTF gateway, um, so pretty much instructs the RTF gateway to create a temporary user. Then it creates a temporary connection to the, ECS, to the, to the newly created container, authorizes the user to access this, uh, this connection. And then after that, uh, the RTF portal will authenticate on the gateway on behalf of the temporary user, and then return an authorization token to the user. We will then present it to the RTF gateway, which then mediates the access for the containers. So in this way, like the, uh, the gateway mediates the access to the containers, but the credentials of the temporary user are never exposed to the end user. So as we understood, uh, the, the gateway mediates the access between containers, uh, uh, between the users and the ECS cluster for the exercises. So together with, uh, with the main deployment, you get one RTF exercise cluster and one RTF gateway. But you can deploy more. So the reason for, do for doing this is uh, it's twofold. So, First, uh, you will increase the number of concurrent exercises you can run. And second, uh, it will reduce the latency. Because of course, I mean, we're talking about an RDP connection that you then see within the browser. So if uh, the server or the cluster is far away in the world, then you know, you, the, the user will experience a lot, and it's, uh, it's not nice. I mean, of course, they don't need to be like everywhere. Like the, the server I used earlier was in Frankfurt. Um, it's possible, so after you deploy the new gateway, it then needs to be onboarded uh, within the management interface, and it's also possible to enable and disable uh, um, exercises based on, the, on for each region. So now I'll discuss the installation. So the installation, um, you first need to do some prep work. You will need to acquire the Docker images for the RTF services. So you can either um, build them from source or you can use pre-built images that you can pull from Docker Hub. Um, then, I mean, you will need an, an account on AWS. So I mean, you'll, you'll need uh, to sign up. Then you'll need a domain. Also with the ability to create subdomains because I, don't know, I usually have the RTF portal on www and then each gateway on each subdomain. So before we connected to www for the platform, and then when we opened a new tab, we were connected to EMEA docs, and that's like my regional gateway for EMEA. 
Um, so you need to, to have a domain, then you need to provision a certificate for this domain on AWS ACM. This is a very cool uh, service because you can either import the, your existing certificate or you can create a new one. If you create a new one, then ACM will take care of the life cycle of the certificate, of renewing it automatically and so on. Uh, you'll then create a repository on ECR, the Amazon Elastic Container Registry, and push the Docker images you acquired in step one uh, to your uh, private repo. Uh, step three, you get the cloud formation templates. So you will have a master template. The master template actually has a number of stacks uh, which are nested in it, but you just need to modify the configuration on the master template. Then all the properties are actually cascaded to the nest the stacks. On the configuration, you need to tweak uh, things like you know, the size of the cluster, um, which kind of instances you want to use, uh, which uh, host name, uh, reference to the SSL certificate, uh, and uh, the images uh, uh, that you uploaded, uh, the address for the images that you uploaded on ECR. You'll then run the template and wait around 11 minutes for uh, the whole infrastructure to launch and all the services to be deployed, and then it's ready to go. Uh, together with the main uh, deployment, uh, you also get a default organization, default team, and default user. When I say default user, there is no default password. There are no hard-coded passwords anywhere. Uh, all the, uh, the passwords are actually uh, configured when you modify the master template, and then they're passed to the containers by environmental variables. Um, so first step, when you get the platform, you will need to populate the user base, so create an organization, uh, teams, uh, users, to mirror the, I mean, how the, your internal organization uh, works. Then you will need to onboard the gateways that you, know, you deployed. So together with the main deployment, you get one gateway, but you can deploy more. Those will need to be onboarded. In order to onboard them, you just need to select the name, uh, select the AWS region on which the, it's the, the gateway was deployed, and the FQDN, that's it. While if you want to add an exercise, that's a three-step uh, three job. You first need to add the exercise metadata. These are the information about the exercise, all the text that we saw earlier about the exercise. Uh, it's quite a bit of work because you need to put description, resources, uh, stuff to read, uh, uh, reference file, solution file, a score, a trophy. So I mean, if you're writing a new exercise, of course, I mean, you will have to input the data because I mean, you, will, you will need to create the text as well. But if you are uh, using an existing exercise, you can just import all this data by importing a JSON file and, and that's it. So after this is done, you will then need to register the exercise on each gateway where you want to make it available. So at this point, you will specify the image or the Docker image that you need to use for the particular exercise. Depending on um, if you have multiple um, ECS cluster, it may, it may be possible to use different images depending on the region, even if it's the same exercise. In this way, you could save some money on the data transfer uh, because the transfers are between different regions uh, you pay. If it's within the same region, you don't pay. Um, lastly, you will need to, to enable the exercise uh, for all the organization you wish to make it available. It's just a toggle switch, and uh, it's done. Different if you want to create a new exercise. So if you want to create a new exercise, we have different approaches. You are um, welcome to fork an existing exercise and add your uh, new vulnerabilities, uh, create, uh, I mean, rebuild the image, and push it, and it will be ready. Otherwise, uh, you can uh, start by modifying a base image. So I'm providing a base image for each technology I'm supporting on RTF. So currently, I support Java, Node.js, and Ruby, but I mean, we can create, we can support any, any stack uh, you wish uh, uh, to be supported. And uh, with the base image, you will get the base image targeting, uh, mirroring the technology of the exercise you want to write. So if you want to write a Java exercise, you will get the Java base image. With the Java-based image, you get the Ubuntu desktop and the support to receive connections with the from the RTF gateway. Then you will get an application server, IDE, and DBMS, uh, which matches the technology of uh, the base image. So if you select Java, you get Eclipse, uh, Tomcat, and MySQL. If you select Node.js, you get Atom, uh, Node.js, and uh, Redis or Mongo. So it really depends on what you, um, what you are choosing. Also because we want to mirror what the developer would use uh, on his stack. No? And uh, also you get the RTF agent. Uh, we'll talk about the RTF agent in the next slide, but um, it's a utility that runs on each, uh, on each uh, image, on each exercise. So from the base image, you will need to add the dependencies, additional dependencies you need for your exercise, and then add the exercise files. So if we are talking about a Java web app, you'll need to add the web project to the Docker image. You'll then build the Docker image, run it locally, and connect uh, to it with any RDP client. So when you have done this, uh, you need to integrate uh, the vulnerable app, vulnerable exercise in the IDE and make the environment nice for the user later to use. So 
um, you, for instance, if you're talking about this Java app, we'll open Eclipse, uh, import the project, set up the build path, uh, make sure it builds, uh, then uh, we will uh, register this uh, web project on, uh, on Tomcat, and uh, we'll make sure it works. So after that, uh, when we are satisfied, uh, we can actually, every time we make this customization, they're actually saved within the users on folder, the RTF users on folder. So at the end of all the customization, you can just export uh, the users on folder, uh, add it to the Docker file, so we are replacing the, the older uh, on folder, and build a new image. So at this point, the image is ready, and you can push it to ECR. Of course, I mean, after you push it to ECR, then you will need to onboard the exercise. So you will have to have the text, onboard it on the gateway, and enable it for an organization. So the RTF agent. Uh, the RTF agent is, um, runs on uh, each um, RTF exercise and provides a number of functionalities uh, to, the, to the platform. So it allows to retrieve the logs from the exercise. It performs the code diff between the original code and the code modified by the candidate. And also, it's an interface to run the automated checker functionality. So behind the scenes, when a user wants to get his results, he issues a request to the RTF portal. The RTF portal then understands which container that we're talking about, and the issues are requested to the RTF gateway. The gateway then contacts the RTF agent on the, uh, on the RTF exercise of the user, and then runs uh, the automated checker. So the automated checker is uh, designed to be completely agnostic from the actual tests, or from the strategy you wish to use to test whether an issue is vulnerable or not. This is because, uh, depending on the issue, there might be different ways and different strategies and multiple programming languages to, to check uh, the, the same vulnerability. And it may be easier to do it one vulnerability rather than another, depending on the actual context. I'll give you two examples. So for instance, if we are talking about a reflected XSS, a reflected XSS is just uh, to, to verify whether it's, uh, the, the app is vulnerable, we just need to check, uh, we just need to send a get request to a vulnerable endpoint we send a payload that uh, we expect to be returning the response in a specific encoding. So if this condition is met, then the issue is still vulnerable. Different, for instance, if we're talking about a DOM XSS. For a DOM XSS, it's not enough to check uh, for the presence of a string in the response, because, I mean, the vulnerability is much more subtle. So uh, we will need to simulate just its execution. I mean, to do that in Java, it's not... No, that's straightforward, no, and uh, maybe I don't know, a different, uh, different uh, approach uh, would be to use a UI automation script. So in this example, I've used Nightmare.js, and with Nightmare.js, I am injecting uh, within the page uh, a payload, and then the payload is actually um, making a side effect, so it's changing a string inside the div, inside uh, an element, an HTML element, and then my test is just checking whether that string is in, is in the element. So if the exploiter run, it would have modified the string, and then the test uh, uh, will return uh, this result. So these two examples are related to a black box approach. No? So we understand from uh, whether an issue is vulnerable or not from um, an external perspective. We understand that based on uh, inferring uh, um, the result from the behavior of the functionality. If, for instance, we were writing a uh, test for an exercise about secure coding, it may be, like, I don't know, uh, create a secure encryption functionality. It may be better to use a unit test, because, I don't know, in that case, we want to test uh, the exercise from the internal perspective and understand how the, the methods, how the code reacts uh, to some particular conditions. So in that way, it may be better to use a unit test. I'm also planning to add support for uh, static analysis at the end of every exercise within the RTF agent. So overall, I think it's a good deal for developers. Uh, they get to learn in an engaging way, 100% uh, hands on, no multiple choice question involved ever. And uh, they can get familiar with uh, uh, most prevalent vulnerabilities, in uh, recognize and secure coding patterns, and so I mean learn new skills. For the business, uh, also it makes it possible to measure real competency in secure coding and remediation, and the business can use these metrics to identify where are the gaps, and then provide targeted training to fill those gaps. Um, and for the community, because it's an open source platform, it can be deployed on AWS using CloudFormation, and uh, can be extended with new support for new technologies and uh, exercises. So uh, I've concluded, uh, I hope you liked the presentation. Uh, I urge you to start using the platform, uh, provide some feedback, 
uh, create then new exercises and, and get in touch to contribute to the development. So if you browse now, it will tell you that uh, we'll put uh, the rest of the documentation after the talk, uh, which I'm about to do in uh, the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'm here. If you want a microphone, put up your hand. Oh. Uh, what's the cost estimation? How much does it cost to run this uh, tool on AWS? So it really depends uh, on, uh, I mean, there are different strategies. So you could use on uh, spot instances, or uh, it really depends on how many exercises you want to run locally. Like, sorry, uh, concurrently. So if you want to run a thousand exercises or if you want to run three, the cost is different. But it's, uh, it grows uh, together with uh, how many concurrent exercises you want to run. Sure. Like, do you want a number? A number would be great, but I understand it's yeah, hard I, to I get. Yeah, I can give you some metrics, but I mean, there is a table, so it's not just one number, it's multiple numbers. Sure, thank you. How big is the current catalog of vulnerabilities that you have? So currently there are, uh, I mean these are test exercises, so there is, a, there is a Java vulnerable app with around 10, 12 exercises, then there is a Node.js app with uh, eight exercises and a Ruby app with uh, another number of exercises. But it's also possible to integrate existing vulnerable apps. So imagine you, know, you have uh, no, web goat, uh, whatever, like whatever application, you just need to write the tests and then it becomes ready to be integrated within RTS. I have a question about user management. Um, how do you handle enterprise level user management or do you have any plans to use something like one login or another SAML provider in the future? Yes, I'm planning to add support for uh, OAuth and uh, SAML. Yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't do everything for the first uh, release. I have a um, question too. Um, you mentioned a few times AWS. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you were tightly coupled with some AWS service, and yes. if not, can I try to deploy this using Kubernetes or? So system? it's, uh, yes. So currently it's, uh, there is a, a lock-in on AWS because I'm using uh, like, I don't know, the ECS, uh, uh, which is the Docker container uh, platform. Uh, then I'm not using Fargate, so it's, I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's still possible uh, with some adaptation to do what you are suggesting. So it's not really, like, the platform is, doesn't really know that it's running on AWS, but uh, for some, um, like, I you know, the EFS file system, for instance, I mean, I couldn't find another alternative. So, I mean, uh, most of the things can be modified, and uh, it's pretty much uh, modifying the cloud formation template. So, then the, the, the RTS services are completely agnostic from uh, the template where they run. Hi, um, this looks really great and is a lot of work. So what's your business model? How do you finance that? So, so this is uh, an open source platform. So I mean, I'm hoping uh, to create a community of people that uh, will the create uh, new exercises and uh, also, the community will be helpful uh, to um, review the exercise. But I think, I don't know, an existing, like a concurrent uh, commercial model may exist. So I think, I don't know, there are many ways uh, forward. Two difficult questions, I guess. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? I noticed you mentioned uh, RDP and there's AWS there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just wondering, our developers are doing all their Windows, uh, all their web development, um, window web no, browser facing stuff using uh, Windows and Visual Studio. Uh, I wonder whether you have any plans in yeah, that direction. Yeah, so that's more uh, something to ask uh, Docker guy. Because I mean, I. Uh, I mean, I can run whatever you can run on Docker. So if you can run a GUI app, uh, a GUI Windows app on Docker, yes. Otherwise, uh, I mean, uh, we're still limited to that. But there are uh, other ways around it. 
So instead of having a, like a Docker container, you can use an EC2 instance. So this is the second version. No? The first version actually used a full EC2 instances. So every time you wanted to launch an exercise, I was actually launching an EC2 instance. But that takes around one minute and 30 seconds, while this takes three, sec three seconds. So that's why I went for this. Yeah. OK, thanks. Anyone else? OK, then another round of applause for Andrea. Thank you.